your past and what Satan had you bound by is your weapon. That's your point of identification of darkness. And imagine what would happen if you put that to use. Instead of denying what you struggled with, some people were drug addicts. Some people were many different things. Listen to me. No one in the house of the living God can judge your life. And what Satan meant for your destruction, it will absolutely be utilized for the glory of the Lord. People are the ones who discourage you from going through your entire process. People do that. Your Father in Heaven never did that. The Holy Spirit never did that. In fact, in your deepest days of calamity, the statement from the Lord was, endure and continue. Look at all the stuff you went through. Look at all the years you were displaced. How is it that you still have your identity intact in the first place? How is it that Satan couldn't get you? How is it that you're still living? How is it that he didn't corrupt your mind so much that you wouldn't believe in Christ? Because I'll tell you something, although he works through many vessels, to get to you on earth, he has no power to take you out. And when he gets close to somebody who's marked by the living God to believe in Jesus Christ, when he gets close to you, he already knows he messed up. He has no choice but to try and kill you, of which you will fail every single time. You know what happens when he gets close? You see him. You see Satan does not want to be seen. He does not want to be known. Demons do not want to be seen. Did you find that out in the Bible? They did not announce themselves to anybody but vessels who had authority over them. They were terrified of Christ Jesus. And they want nothing to do with you either. They're trying to trick you because they know the authority that lies within you. You may not know it, but you carry the entire authoritative word of the kingdom inside you. When you keep your identity, you're always going to try and take credit for all the blessings that happen in your life. But when you walk out of your identity of flesh into the spirit, you're not concerned about credit. You do what you do authentically that the other may benefit. You see the difference? All of you have a spiritual identity that is severely blessed and is absolutely favored. But listen, your flesh identity is neither blessed nor is it favored. So understand this. With the word of God comes a challenge. Always. Too many people are afraid of that word suffering. But you have already suffered. This season is full of such favor. That if a person were to get into the word and their life totally blew up in front of their faces. Should they stay with the word, it wouldn't be like old times. See, in old times, your problem took you away from the word and tied up your life and beat you down, didn't it? All you had to do was stay there. Stay in the word. Now, I'm not telling you something I read. I'm telling you something I know. No matter what comes, your studies in the Bible don't ever give them up. Had somebody told me, as you get into the word, troubles are supposed to come. The breakdowns are supposed to come. Because I would say, why are they supposed to come? Because it's a measure of faith that must be proven. Every time God will entrust anybody with his word, he will always give them the test. And what test is that? You get the opposite. It looks like you're about to get the opposite of a blessing. You're tested on every side to see if you'll stay faithful to his word. That one small thing. In other words, to continue in his word, and you're not letting the word go, but you're letting your worry go. That's staying the course. To continue to operate in meekness and humility and not blow up at everybody because your situation is blowing up. Because what the Lord was putting on you is just a sample of what he has already prepared to have revealed through you. See, some of you, you yearn to be a vessel of usage for the Lord. You, you don't want to be useless. In fact, one of the biggest complaints out of just about everybody in COT is they don't ever want to be useless. They're not doing enough for the Lord. That's their number one complaint. They want to actually do something for the Lord this time in this season. Instead of pushing the Bible aside, Fight through that storm. You're going to find Jesus standing in the middle of that storm. Within the impossible situation, should you stay the course, that's when he speaks peace to that storm. It's also when you are elevated. See, God will not promote a person who is not worthy of that promotion. And to be worthy of that promotion is to be dedicated to his word. Keep this in mind. Somebody's always watching you. So if somebody were to watch your life, what would you communicate to them about Jesus? Think about it. How many of you often find yourself internally complaining about the person that always knows what you're doing? You may cross your arms in frustration. Well, how does this person even know? I didn't even tell anybody that. You get angry when they start telling you where you're going. That person that's watching you is assigned to watch you. In fact, your worst enemy that judges you by everything you do. You're the one meant to change their lives. Most people don't even know that. 
They always pray to the Lord, Lord, this person just won't get out of my life. I could have a peaceful life and accomplish anything if this person were not in it. But that person never goes away. That person is there like super glue. And you always want this person gone because that's the only person that can get to you the way they do. And don't you find that strange? How can anybody on earth get to you in that one specific way? But everybody else is okay. Just that one person can get to you that way. I've heard people say, you know, I'm okay until that one person shows up. And when they show up, I always see to regress. I, I just get in this strange thing. What do you think that is? Well, let me break break it to you. That, first of all, supernatural. Not to be funny, but can you separate the smell from dog poo? No. Nor will you separate that person from yourselves. You wonder why this person won't go away. It's like you're locked into a prison with this person. This person shows up at the wrong time every time. Haven't you noticed that when you're trying to do something that you don't want anybody to know about or see? This person Pops up. Matter of fact, you cannot do anything for months. And as soon as you set your mind to do something, that person pops up. It's like their timing is the worst timing in the world. Don't you know that's supernatural? And listen to me carefully. That person's not supposed to go away. Would you like to know why? Here it is. Out of all the people you've met in your life, they see the person you have constructed. Or they're not concerned about any deep flaws or anything else in your life. But this one person can see all of you, the good and the bad. They can see all of you. And this one person is actually helping you. You just don't know it yet because you're being compromised emotionally. Here's how they help you. Because if you were in life to forgive everybody in your life, that would be great. But everybody in life is not your challenge. That person is. See, that person represents a weakness in you. That one person represents a weakness still left in you that must be purged prior to you going anywhere off this earth. Because if you go off this earth, not having been purged of what this person can often touch, you have not overcome what you were supposed to overcome. Does everybody understand that? A day will come when true love will flow through you. A day will come when that person will have no power to touch any part of you that will annoy you so bad to cause you to sin anymore. Why? Because the day is coming when you will love that person. And when they start naming things you will not deny, you'll agree. You'll look out for that person's interests. And the Lord will show you that person in that day when you respond with love, when you're truly concerned about where this person is going. That's also the day when this other person will be delivered from what has hold of them. You see how that works? You're an instrument of their deliverance. They are an instrument of yours. It also is a good simulation or emulation of life itself, of how that you can overcome so many things that people know about, but it's what people don't know about that can condemn you. That person is supernaturally in your life and no prayer is going to rid you of that individual. Once you are purged of what can be touched, once you are fixed by the great physician, of the things that are breaking down in you that this person often exposes, then everything changes. See, that's near the completion of your race. You don't want that person to go anywhere because every time they come around and you're emotionally compromised, they expose a weakness in you that the Lord desires for you to have healed. Do you see that? Because no one, no spirit, no person, no situation should ever be able to cause you to sin ever again. And if it can, that's a severe weakness. Through that person, the roots of an issue are being exposed. It's not meant for you to cover it up. It's meant for you to be healed of it. So no matter how much you pray, that person's not going anywhere because your Father in Heaven loves you. He will not lose you. See, if that person can cause you to sin, you've got no chance against Satan. If that person can make you lose your holiness in a moment, Imagine what Satan could do to you. Once you have overcome what's working through that person, you will have overcome darkness. God took the greatest obstacle in your life and assigned it to you. And it will not go away. Because if it goes away, you'll never be healed of what it exposes. Do you see that? Because how many years have you been trying to pray it away? And it looks like even if you try, have you noticed that when you try to do something, you're the one that feels guilty? Why is it that you're drawn back to it? God showed you, okay, you want to separate from it, then separate. But what did you do? You felt guilty, didn't you? Some way, somehow, thoughts came over you. You said, this isn't right. You right back to torment, you went. No, that's not torment, that's a test. They're designed to come at your moment. When you have built yourself up in your own confidence, they come to break it down. One day you'll learn, never build yourself up in your own confidence. 
build yourself up upon the foundation of Christ Jesus, and nothing will remove you. He's giving you an example of a parable of what it is to have your house built upon sand and other foundations that are not him and how easily it can be broken. Can't you see? Now you know what that person's for. Remember those things. You're overcomers, victorious, but as a spiritually reborn child of the living God. You're not victorious by what you created. I'm not victorious by what I created. I can step into the promise of the living God, but I cannot make the promise of the living God come to fruition. You see how that works? These are valuable things that are untouched by most. And you'll also share a burden because once you really understand, you realize many do not have ears to hear. You cannot speak to a deaf man, nor can you show something to a blind man. And that's where a petition comes in. That the Lord may cause them a blindness that they may see. Deafen their ears from hearing what they have been hearing so that they can hear. That's what the Lord is doing in front of you. Most people look at the situation as something disastrous. No, it isn't. It's not disastrous. It's necessary. It's never good to endure crippling pain and displacement, those things. But all of us should understand something. If Jesus were to appear right now, that's a clear message to everybody it's over. Wherever a person is, that's going to be their condition for eternity. And if they're not, if they have not met God's requirements, they cannot be a child of the kingdom. And that would be a great tragedy. If you could time travel and you were standing at the judgment and you saw countless generations being judged guilty. And the Lord said, okay, I can sing you back in time. I'm going to sing you back to 2022. What would you say? Would you still see this war the same way? Probably not. But you would yell out to the top of your lungs. Can't you see what the Lord is showing you? That your way doesn't work. These are endless wars. They will always be fought because that is the result of man's progression without the living God. When man has freedom, when man has been empowered, they will always self-destruct. So what is the Lord doing? Well, I'll tell you something. There were a lot of Russians and are a lot of Russians who are seeking salvation. This conflict has caused them so much guilt. They want to be forgiven. They can feel. One gentleman put it, he can feel the guilt and it's worse than death. Now you tell me, what school can you go to to have such conviction? Who could talk in such an eloquent way to communicate such conviction? You can't do that. I can't do that. People on earth cannot do that. But this situation, it did that. And we're not just talking about two or three. No, there have been too many. And when I say too many, it is an unbelievable number you'll no doubt hear about in the weeks to come. You will hear them by their own statements. The Lord is saving souls, not comforting sin. These things are purposed before you. It doesn't mean you root for the war. I don't like war. But if the Lord allows it, there's a purpose behind it. There's something you should know in this world. Number one, if it weren't necessary, you would have never gone through it. If it weren't necessary, it would never take place. Why? Because God does nothing in vain and he does not promote folly. When the earth was destroyed, that was purposed and necessary. Satan does not want anybody to know why God would do such a thing. Wouldn't it have been easier just to take Noah and his family and bring them up to heaven? Why destroy everybody else? Why not reform them? Why destroy them? Now, I'm telling you right now, it was highly purposed. And just so you understand this, evil is already dead. So what God really did was he saved souls and removed the evil. That man's initial charge could happen again. And he did not remove all evil. If God wanted all evil gone, Satan would not exist anymore nor with the fallen angels. We forget that, don't we? Sometimes we act like God has no power to undo everything of Satan. Sometimes we act that way. If they were purposed, they would not exist. So why do they exist? When something is committed in righteousness, it must be true. No one's going to trick nor deceive the Most High. So everything is tried. Our faith is tried. Our servitude is tried. How is it tried? By opposition. If you're not receiving opposition, you're not being tried. And if you're not being tried, the Lord is not qualifying it. Satan is but a tool. Darkness is a tool. Darkness does not pose the Father any problems. That's mankind has promoted that. You know what God said? God said, who can stand against me? I would consume them all. So sometimes our picture of existence is a bit distorted out of reality. No, the Lord is doing something here with us. It exists for our sakes. It qualifies what we do because what you do, you do by faith. 
If you really don't believe in something, you're not going to subject yourself to all loss doing it. You're going to say, nope, the cost is too high. I'm not doing this. And you'll simply back out. When it's not worth it, you're not going to do it. That's why criminals just don't all go run to the bank and rob it because it's not worth it. That's why men back down in view of most weapons because it's not worth it. Listen now, when something is worth it, you don't care what comes against it, do you? You mothers with your children, if you had to run through 16 yards of thorn bushes barefooted to get to your infant, you would die trying. Why? Because to save that infant's life is worth it. And you will say to yourself, I don't care what it takes. At the expense of my own life, that child will live. And you'll make a declaration and you will not back away from it. But you would not do that for a doll. If a doll were out there and you had all your mental faculties, you would not run through thorn bushes to go and rescue a doll. Not a dog, D-O-G, a doll, D-O-L-L. You wouldn't do that because it's not worth it. You would say, oh, well, hmm, it's going to be a long time before I get that little thing over there. These thorn bushes have to die out first. Then I may go get it, but then it'll be too dirty, so forget it. Listen, when the word of God is precious to you, when his way is precious to you, you don't care how many thorn bushes are in front of you. With all your fear, uncertainty, and everything else, you'll set your heart to go forward, period. You'll take whatever comes. You're not looking for anything, a handout, help, or anything else. You are determined. When you are determined, when it's worth everything, nothing can stop you. Here's what Satan does, though, in your lives. God has already set you up for something like that so that you can experience what true deliverance is, what a miracle is. Yes, even Jesus said God wants you to experience these things so that your trust will not be challenged. But you know what? Something stops us. Something talks us out of it. And many of us don't have experience with true deliverance. Many of us don't have experience with the true miracles. Why? Because something talked us out of it. Something told us in our minds, it's not worth it. Somebody else can get it. There's another way. And why did that voice of opposition come? To see if we would take it. See, if your child was over there, anybody could come to you and say, well, just get her in a couple of hours. She'll be okay. You say, no, I will not. Doing it. Nothing could talk you out of it. It doesn't matter what would come. Nothing would stop you from getting that child immediately. Nothing would stop you. When it's worth it, nothing can stop you. And this is the key point. Because when the gospel of Jesus Christ, when it's truly worth it, you're not going to be stopped. But let's qualify that remark though. What do you mean worth it? How could the gospel be worth it? Is it worth it? Have you guys ever considered that? Is carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ, is it worth your life? Yes or no? The Lord gave us another principle. He said, be careful how you hear. Be careful how you see. If you're thinking of the gospel as a tool, as a some, some standard that man can have, that he can be forgiven, and that's it, well, then guess what? That may not be worth it. Anything can come to you and say there's an alternative way. But all you had to do was look at yourselves and remember your own cries. Don't you remember standing in the midst of darkness among so many? And they were looking for things in the earth, but you were looking for a way out. Do you remember that? Remember how you gazed in many directions, looking for something that you would recognize that you could run to, but you didn't find it. Don't you remember what it felt like to feel all alone? Though you were surrounded, you were isolated because you weren't looking for what everybody else was looking for. Don't you remember that? There are people out there right now and they're searching and looking. Guess what they're going to see? They're going to see you. You are their hope. When you speak, that's when they're going to hear. When you show up, is the light they will see. Satan knows this. So he's trying to get you not to show up. How does he do this? By making the gospel ordinary or not important at all. But here's how important it is. How bad did you want somebody to show up in your youth, in your time of crisis? Pretty bad, huh? How many times did you wonder, Lord, why didn't you show up? Why didn't you do this? Some of you right now, your faith is weakened because nobody showed up. And I'll say it again, you're not certain if the Lord's going to keep you from all of what a person could endure. You're just not sure. And fear is there. You don't have to hide it here. You would have given anything for somebody to show up. Many of you cried for someone to show up. So the gospel travels through people. The Lord said, how can one hear unless one be sent? That's a principle in the Bible. And it's God's method. So he will load you up with what somebody else needs. So when they're hungry, 
He put the food in you. It's part of who you are. But if you don't show up, that work won't be complete and somebody will cry, receiving nothing just like you did, although it can be utilized for good. It'd be awesome if you could show up to rescue somebody else. And let me ask you this. Why is that at the root of your heart? Do you know how defensible you guys are? Let me tell you something. If you were to hear somebody out there speaking falsely, you would get disgusted. Do you know why? Not for your own sakes. Because you can't stand the idea of somebody else being fooled. You can't stand the idea of somebody else receiving a false witness. You can't stand that idea. In fact, if you were to perceive that, and you have perceived that it didn't cause you to walk away from others. You said, oh no, no. And it didn't matter who you are or what your own personal sin level is. You cannot tolerate that for somebody else. Haven't you ever thought of that? Haven't you ever asked yourself, Lord, at the height of my sin, I still had compassion for somebody else being fooled. How can that even be possible? When you were living in the world, you did not like the idea of somebody else being deceived by way of their faith. Answer that one. So tell me what that is. Come on, somebody. Your roots are deeper than you know. That's been with you for a long, long, long time. Do you know why? Because you, you are appointed ones. And Satan knows this. That's why you're quirky. He already knows who you are. You don't know who you are. Satan knows. And if he can talk you out of things, he'll do it every day, every moment of your life. He invests most of his time on you anyway by way of your mind in conversation because he knows he'll lose real estate once you fully believe there's nothing he can do anyway so what he does is he gives you a false impression of what the gospel is he will distort it in your early days he tried to ruin your concept of love itself and so many of you have an alternative concept of love he did that that's why many of you are so heartbroken you're broken by way of your heart big time because he tried to give you a false interpretation of what love is he tried to make you believe the music why do you think they even wrote the music love hurts no it does not love is blind no it isn't all these things they write in songs people remember and that's how people run around in the world when I first got COT, somebody said, well, there's several types of love. No, it is not. It's one type of love. All the rest of it's a lie. And then somebody said, well, you know, loving and being in love are two different things. What? Oh, Satan just put confusion all over the place. That is man's nonsense. A way for him to live with his pain. Categorize it, throw it in a book, and everybody's fine with it. That's like, well, you run around and your arm hurts all the time. You go to a doctor. Doctor says, well, you have hurt a arm or uh, something. And he gives you a medication. You say, oh, that's good. I have a disease and I'm fine with it now. And I got medication for it. You're good. You can live with a hurting arm. But I'm not like that. Nobody's going to give me a name for something. And then I'm content. Are you kidding? That's like being content with a demon living in your life. That's not going to happen. But that's what the world does. And who set that up? Satan did. He puts a name on every spirit that functions among humanity on the dark side. And people are content with living with it. They even claim it. Well, my bronchitis is cutting up. Well, my cancer. Well, it's my this and my that. They've learned to live with it. But the Lord called you to a higher standard. See, oh, you can see it now, can't you? It's starting to click in it. You say, wait a minute. There's something to that. Of course it is. Because that's how Satan works. Methodically. He is an integral part of most of these kingdoms and systems in this world designed to cause a blindness. And so if he can mess up your concept of love itself, he's got you. Because you'll never trust love when it comes in your direction. He tried to get you like that. He tried to get you to repel true love. That is very obvious in the relationships people have in the world. They'll keep an abusive relationship, but they will absolutely reject a good one. What is that? That's because Satan is altered by way of perception, the concept of what love is. Let me remind you, God is love. That means love is perfect. Love is intentioned. Love is, has no error. Love is always giving. It needs to receive nothing. Love is highly purposed in your lives. And that's the most powerful component on the face of the earth and in the heavens because so is our Father. In the Bible, when it says God is love, that's not just some poetic statement. It's telling you something about love itself. When that mother would walk through those thorn bushes to get that child and she would die doing it, that's called love. That's love. Love is a power. What a person would feel behind love is nothing more than the residue of that power when they've experienced true love. But love is a power. Love is the power. All things exist by love itself or th nothing will exist all things are held together by love love is by no means a concept men have made unto themselves man has a bad habit when they can't obtain it or walk into it they redefine it 
They did the same thing with love. They tried to make love what they wanted it to be, but love has, it already has a name. It's already been identified. If you have that love in your life, then you have a yearning for somebody else receiving the best of the best. And that's why you guys can't stand for somebody else to be beguiled spiritually. Of all the things, you cannot stand that somebody else be beguiled spiritually. Who do you think that is? That's your true love for somebody else. That's the real love working in your life in a very real situation. Why don't you feel up for everything else? Because if you think carefully enough, you'll find that everything else is manufactured. A tradition, a way that's been taught by man that's not holy at all. But in the most holy things, there are things established within you that have been put there by the living God that no man nor spirit can take away. Satan never wants you to make that connection. He wants you to walk around with one eye shut all the time. Well, time for those eyes to go wide open. And I hope that you guys can figure this out. You really see it. Because when you walk in love itself, there is no darkness in love. Do you know that? No demon will occupy the space of God Almighty. No devil will occupy the space of God Almighty. That's why the Bible says there's no place in heaven found of Satan anymore. He has no placement in heaven. Why? Because when Jesus went to go sit at the right hand of the living God, that's your advocate. He cannot accuse. What did he do at the throne of God? He accused them before our God day and night. But when Jesus went to sit at the right hand of the Father, Satan had no place. How can he accuse when Jesus stands ready to forgive? And when I say stands ready, he already died on the cross. That's an action that's still in motion. The blood still covers. Satan has no job at the throne of God accusing anybody because God will not hear it due to his son. So what does the Bible say? Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For Satan has come down to you having great breath, knowing he hath but a short time. What is he doing? He's pursuing the remnant of the seed of the woman, the believers. He's after you to corrupt you, to corrupt your mind, your concepts, and he's losing. But there are some out there who have been held in bondage by him. They're just like that small child, and Satan has set thorns all around him. So the question is this, who would forego themselves so that child out there can be delivered? Because the Lord put you on earth and you do believe for that purpose. You are the instruments of God Almighty. You are here and have been enabled to carry out the desires of the living God. That's awesome. You're the ones who, animals have not been empowered to do that. You have been. You are specifically designed to carry out all of what he would command. Did you know that God never sends anybody who's not able? If you're not able, he won't send you. Which means what? If he sends you, he also grants you the ability to accomplish what he sent you to do. Do you know that? That means every single angel that is dispatched receives power to do exactly what God assigned them to do. See, with God's word, when one says, yes, I'll go do it, they're in obedience. And when they're in that obedience, God is within them. That power is within them. Jesus spoke to this very thing at great length and he wanted them to see it to believe it to utilize their faith to get away from satanic lies didn't you notice that the pharisees listen to me this is so easy to see but the con but but it takes growth to really receive it into yourselves in the new testament all the experts the priests and the pharisees and all these guys you know what they did they talked against a person being empowered by the living god they did not want that didn't you notice every time the conversation came about where the average person would be empowered by the living God. They said, oh, no, 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 no. And they hated Christ for that. You know what the truth is? God put more in you than any opposition you could ever face in this world. But if Satan can talk you into believing you don't have it, then you will sit there and suffer blow after blow of things you can have long since overcome. He's telling us to put things down that we're beating ourselves up with. We just can't see the truth of it, so we keep smacking ourselves with it. Because how many times have we entered into the exact same situation, receiving the exact same results? How many times have we caught ourselves in a cycle? Everything is okay, and then all of a sudden, we're the ones that invite chaos into our lives. How about a person being debt-free? As soon as they're debt-free and their income rises, what do they go do? I've seen this so many times, it's not funny. A person will have a job, and they'll start complaining, well, I'm going to get out of debt. After years, they really get out of debt, but as soon as they're free of the debt, guess what happens? They will think up something they need to go right back into debt again. They won't be satisfied until they restart the cycle again. And then as soon as they restart the cycle, they're back to the complaints. And they'll say, why did I do it? That's Satan at work. Always speaking. And for those who won't wait for comprehension of the word of God, Satan will always give you an alternative. 
because he's always speaking. That's why somebody said, well, you know, I just speak my mind. And I said, no, don't do that. Don't speak your mind. Because the Bible says, take captive your thoughts. That means everything that enters into your mind. You know what your mind is, right? Your mind is a table. A table where many spirits come and sit and communicate with you. And whatever you accept at that table goes down into the heart. And what goes down into the heart eventually comes out of your mouth and you begin to do it and live by it. But the Lord said, take captive your thoughts. So somebody comes at that table and they're not supposed to be there. Do not entertain that thought. Don't tell it how it's wrong. Don't be the expert of how somebody is wrong. That's entertaining. Satan. No, give it no room, give it no space. When you do that, you can never enter into the heart and your heart is free. Once your heart fills up, things ooze out of your mouth. See, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It did not say, out of your heart, the mouth speaketh. It said, out of the abundance. That means, whatever your language is, that's what you're full of. If I were to get angry, no cursing would come from my mouth because that's not my heart wasn't always that way. All that stuff is it's just not there anymore. So it's never an option. If the Lord can do that through me, you have no idea of what he is stands ready to do through you. So what I'm telling you guys tonight is this. There's a season here. How many of you really want real change? I'm, I'm not talking about some fictitious change either. No. There's a yearning that you have. There's an accomplishment that you have within you. You can't define it, but you know it's there. How many want that? How many are not satisfied where they are with the Lord? I'm still not satisfied. I'm not satisfied at my position with the Lord. I am not, I'm not, I'm not. Every day I will fight to go further until the Lord calls me home. I don't do that within myself for my own edification either because I understand something else. Jesus said, what you have done to the least of these, you've also done unto me. But listen, he also said something else. What you have not done for the least of these, you have not done for me. So guess what? Many people say, Lord, I want to serve you. Here it is. To serve the Lord is to serve your fellow man. What you render unto your fellow man, you have rendered unto the Lord. That's why the Bible says, do unto your fellow man as you would do unto the Lord. Why? Because when you do something for them, Jesus is the recipient in them of your good things. That's why you should never worry about what a person rejects. Do all things with everything you have in uprightness, never to repay, always to edify and to build up. By doing so, you now have a blessed giving. Whatever it is will carry a blessing and power. And when it goes into that person or into the hands of that person, it's going to change that individual. But I said, if you keep your eyes open, nothing will be secret from you. And right now, you're not seeing something new develop. You're not seeing some new hatred. People aren't just becoming awful. What you're seeing is what has always been there. It's just been covered up. People have been fooled. See, the truth is this. These people that are cutting up and coming out, acting this way and that way, that's not new. They covered it up. You were believing what they wanted you to believe at first, that they weren't like that. Now they have no desire to hide it. And it's coming out all by its lonesome. And now you're seeing the truth. And the truth, well, you thought this was a beautiful place and that people were beautiful. No, you're just seeing truth. You're seeing the truth of what has been. It's been covered up. Suppose a person one day just pops up and they say, I don't like you. Well, normally they just don't do that. They say, you know, I never liked you from the beginning. And they give you a bunch of reasons why. The first day they didn't like you. Now listen, I bring up this point to say this. How many of you said, Lord, just show me the truth. I want to see the truth. Now you know why he didn't show you the truth in the beginning. See, you're seeing the truth now and many people can't handle it. What you see happening overseas is not something new. It is the truth revealed. It's what's been there all this time. You just couldn't see it. So I'm going to liken that because a lot, lot of you guys, you say, I want the truth and nothing but the truth. Lord, show me the truth. Well, let me tell you what that entails. That means you'll be sitting up with your family. The Lord will show you the truth about them too. You're going to find out something that you don't want to find out. Let me ask you this. If you found out that one of your family members did a horrible thing, are you going to hate them for it? Now, you've been living with them all this time. You've known them all this time. You've loved them all this time. But you learn of something old, and all of a sudden, you start to hate them by something that you learned of that's always been there. But because you just now find it out, it alters your relationship. Well, let me tell you this. God cannot show you the truth like that if you're going to hate everyone you see the truth of. So for every Christian out there, remember we're sinners saved by faith. That all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And statements like people would stand up with their chest poked down. I can't stand a liar. That same individual, guaranteed, 
or tell somebody, well, I'm, I'm just not available. You know, when you need me at that time, we'll set up another time. They're not doing anything. They just lied. So they'll cross their arms. They don't like the liar. Everybody found out who just lied. But they themselves will turn around and lie. And if they say, no, I have not, then they said the opposite of what Jesus did. Jesus already told us what we truly are. By way of the flesh, only with him are we redeemed. We're by no means redeemed by ourselves. So if God were to show you the truth, the question is, are you ready to still love your enemy as yourself, seeing the truth of your enemy? Are you ready to love your family members when you know the whole truth about them? When you find out they couldn't stand you when you were little, or you found out something sick, or you found out something that was totally wrong that they should have never done, or they're responsible for something you've struggled with all your life, are you still going to love them? Or is you finding out a fact, if you find out some fact about them, is it going to cause you to hate them? Because if you hate anybody for any reason, there's no way you're going to step foot in the kingdom of God. To realize who you are is very important. To not deny what you've been delivered of is very important. Because when you reflect upon those things, you will not point your finger at another soul. That's when you become useful. When you're no longer concerned about finding the faults of somebody else, that's when you become useful. Then you become like me. I don't, because I have a saying. People have called this saying dumb. It's a standard I live by. You ready? I don't care who you were yesterday. The person that's in front of me today is who I talk to. I cannot talk to who you were yesterday. I only know the one in front of me. How about that? I'm not concerned about what you did yesterday. I deal with people today, right now. I don't see people by what they did or what they didn't do. Because I know that all people change. If more Christians did that then more Christians would be free of the torment they find themselves in. Listen, I look for people to be delivered. So a person who's looking for the deliverance of another is certainly not concerned about their bondage from yesterday. Who that person is is dead, and yesterday no longer exists. I can't have a conversation about who they used to be, because that person is dead. Who they are today is the one I will talk to. And I will not see them for who they can be tomorrow. I'm concerned about the person they are today. I'm not alive tomorrow. I'm alive today. I'm not alive yesterday. The Lord put me in this day. That's why I don't walk around stressed about people. In the Bible, as with all these kingdoms, the Lord has a way. And he desires us to know these seasons and his ways. How do we know this? Because he said he changes not. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. He changes not. And you know what that means? We can know him. We can't know all of them, but we can know him. He gave us a sufficient amount of history that we can know him. Once you investigate that, you begin to see how he works. And I'm telling you, it's like a clock. It's the best clock you'll ever have. The timing of the Lord is not our timing. All of you have experience by what you messed up the first time. You're sober now. There'll be no need to waste anything now because we have wisdom. Wisdom only comes to those who have fallen. Do you know that? You have to fall to gain wisdom. Those who will have wisdom enough to say, don't do that because the end result will hurt, they had to fall themselves to gain that wisdom. So all the mistakes you have made in your life equate to wisdom. And if you fell a lot, then you're twice as wise. You have placement for those who have not fallen too much. That's what's meant by those who are last to be first. Why? Those who are last will be fed the most by those who have the greatest experience. Do you know that? You've gone through just about everything. So if somebody were to just come to Christ today, you could feed them good food. Many of you came early during a time when things weren't quite established and the food was just really beginning on a complex basis. All those who were born again in this day, they're going to receive good food. There's never been a time where so much information could be shared in the first place. Where a person could peer over the whole world and get a sense of the whole world. That's never happened. Where a person could view the events of the entirety of the earth and hear the statements spoken of in the Bible come to fruition. For example, the Lord said, there will be earthquakes and floods in diverse places. Who could see that? But those who have an ability to view the USGS, to look at the news, to, to have social media and all these things. And so when something shakes, people can't help but to report it. And because God's word is true, every single person on earth is playing the role in prophecy. When something happens in the earth, they can't wait to go tell it. So that if something takes place, it will be told about. Because in prophecy, God said, you will see this and you will see that. So we had to have the internet and they had to fix video. A telephone would not do because you can't see through a telephone. Television was expensive and certain people couldn't have it in their areas. Now digital communications covers the entirety of the globe. There's not one spot on earth with a blank signal. Did you know that? 
And that's as of this year. There's not one spot on the Earth with a dead signal. So then the capability has been established in 2022 that everybody on the face of the Earth has an ability to see what's happening around the Earth. That means prophecy is going to speed up a year. Things will speed up because things are in place. Prophecy is total and finite, and nothing in prophecy will be missed. All of us had to have an ability to see specific things. In the New Testament, they said the time is at hand. They were talking about the time of the end. They kept saying that over and over again. But that was 2,000 plus years ago. The time is at hand means they're in the middle of that time. Well, who marked the end age? Christ Jesus did. And an age only lasts for so long. For those concentrated about timing, thinking it's too long, let me share this with you. There will be many who stand and they'll cry. Lord, I wish I would have had more time. Every disaster we have on the face of the earth, people utter that statement. I wish I would have known about this years ago. I would have moved my family. Well, guess what? The warnings as of late that have gone out years ago, they're starting to begin. You're about to see what all the prophets spoke of. And then all the words of the prophets will be fulfilled shortly. It matters now, your relationship with Christ, how you approach everything. Why? Because you're the selected and elected ambassadors of Christ in the earth. You are not powerless, but are full of power through Christ Jesus. So operate in him, not within yourselves, not by your own will, but by his calling. Begin to live your lives. Your children of the kingdom. So go ahead and establish that kingdom life right now. Raise up that standard and experience what you have never experienced before. What is that, you may ask? All the deliverance he spoke of. When you're in a trial, don't squeeze out of it. Go right through it. In fact, go through everything and experience all things because life is not about ducking and dodging. This was never meant to be a paradise. This is an experience. And the greatest of all those experiences is the loving touch and deliverance of the Most High. You only get this one chance. You don't get a second chance at this. What you do here counts. Please don't be one of those who will stand in regret if they did not take it seriously.